This is Office Hours at Duke University. Today's conversation is with Professor Randy Journal. He'll be discussing a new branch of science beyond genetics called epigenetics. Everyone watching is invited to participate in the conversation. To do that, just send an email to live at duke.edu or tweet with the tag Duke Live or post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page. Professor Jurdle, we're here at your online office hours. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for inviting us. And uh, let's hit some highlights about you. There was a recent Time Magazine cover story that cited your research as a dramatic example of the power of this new field of epigenetics. Another article in the Scientist magazine said that a mouse produced in your lab is a poster child for the field. And here at Duke, you are the director of the Epigenetics and Genomic Imprint Lab. So let's start with this poster child mouse. It is uh, larger and more yellow than a standard mouse. It's pictured here next to a regular mouse with brown fur. The large yellow mouse also has health problems associated with it, more likely to have diabetes or cancer. But now here's the surprise, they are genetically identical. So what gives, what happened here with these mice? Well, what we did with this study that got, gave rise to these two different, very different type of mice is that we fed the mothers a different diet. Uh, the yellow mouse came, the mother basically ate normal mouse chow whereas the mother of the brown mouse ate a diet that was supplemented in folic acid, choline, etc. Why we chose those uh, supplements is because they donate little tags that are put onto the DNA called methyl groups. All of those methyl groups come in from our diet. So our diet is extremely important in altering what is called the epigenome. Okay, now you've used the word epigenome. We're talking right. about epigenetics. And people are probably wondering, what is epigenetics? It's, it's a word we're just beginning to hear in the popular press. Right. I mean, simply, the word epi, it comes from the Greek derivation, and it just means above or over, like epicenter means above the center. So epigenetics means above genetics. Epigenome would mean above the genome. But I, I like, when I talk to people, I like to use the analogy of a, of a computer. If you think about the DNA sequence, the, the double-stranded helix, as being comparable to the hardware of your computer, then the epigenome is the software that tells that computer when, where, and how to work. So what we're really talking about now are the programs, literally programs that are established in our, in our cells at the DNA level that tell a cell, for example, to be a liver cell, uh, a neuron, an eye cell, a skin cell. We have one genome. We inherit one copy from the mother and one from the father. But yet we have 250 to 300 different cell types. How can that possibly be? The reason it is because, in effect, we have a programmable computer. So there's a different set of programs that are running in, a, for example, a liver cell than in a neuron. And the epigenome as a collection within the cell is that set of programs. So we've already got a question about this software layer on mm -hmm. top of the hardware of the genes. It comes in by email from Ragna with a, a Netherlands email address, mm -hmm. so all the way from Europe. And Ragna asks, through which processes, agents, materials can the phenotype, so the, the actual characteristics of here a mouse, be changed without modifying the DNA sequence? Right, so we'll go back to those poster children. The difference between those is there's a bit of DNA upstream of what is called the agouti gene. Okay. And if the agouti gene is on continuously, it gives rise to that beautiful blonde coat color. Whereas if that agouti gene is now, its the expression is, develop, is normal uh, expression, then you have the brown coat color. So normally in mice, that expression of that agouti gene is dependent upon the developmental stage of development. And so what you normally have is a black hair shaft, and right at the end of the development of the hair shaft, it turns on the agouti gene and it puts just a little yellow band at the base of a black hair shaft, and we now see the mouse as being brown. That's the brown mouse. But in this agouti model that we're using, there's a bit of DNA upstream of the agouti gene that now overrides that developmental control. 
and it's completely dependent upon the marks that are established at the very earliest stages of development. So if that bit of DNA is completely methylated, all those lots of methyl groups are established here, you go back to the normal regulation of the Goody gene and the mouse is brown. Whereas if the decision is made very early to not methylate anything, this promoter region or control region here overrides the one down here and you have inappropriate expression of the Goody gene throughout the whole animal, throughout its whole life. And now the animal is yellow. So why the yellow animals become obese is because this protein in those animals is inappropriately expressed in the satiation center of the brain. And it blocks a receptor. And as a consequence, the mouse never knows it's full. So it literally eats itself into obesity, diabetes, and cancer. But all of the action occurs very early and depends upon those marks being placed at this one little region upstream of the Goody gene. And those are methyl groups, so it's being reprogrammed. The environment can mess this up. So you have a methyl group turning on or turning off a gene. Right. And that's the, the mechanism that you showed in this study in 2003. Correct. And so what, why this is so important is because there's a lot of evidence right now from human studies, animal studies, et cetera. And in humans, the, the sort of the gold standard of this is the Dutch famine back at the end of World War II where there was a severe <clears throat> famine because the Nazis put an embargo of food coming in and the winter was particularly severe and people had a very, very low amount of, of food that they could eat and calories that they could consume. And about 60% of the children that were in utero at that time died because of this severe restriction of food. But of the 40% or so that, that were born, they tended to be of smaller stature and found out later on in life that they had increased incidence of cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, et cetera. But the mechanism for this memory, how can something that occurs way back here cause problems in adulthood was not known until our Goody Mouse study was published in 2003. And that mechanism basically is the alteration of programs epigenetically. So this Dutch study was an association study within people, humans. So there's evidence that these epigenetic changes can be, may be happening with humans. There's evidence that they probably are happening in humans, but right now we don't have direct evidence of which genes are being altered that give rise to these types of problems. Whereas in this agouti mouse, we know exactly what gene is being altered in its expression epigenetically. And so those are the two extremes right now that we have in research. We, we can see things that are happening that probably are epigenetic, for example, in humans, but we don't know what the targets are yet. Got it. Professor Jurdle, we have 36 people participating in office hours here, and uh, we've got another email question. And I'm not going to get through all these. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have questions coming in, and uh, we, we can accept more questions. To do that, everyone watching can send an email to live at duke.edu. You can tweet your question with the tag Duke Live, or you can post it to the Duke University Facebook page. So let's take a look at this question that comes from Tyler and talking about what do we mean when we say epigenetic. And so he says, do you agree with the following statement? All epigenetic events are ultimately driven by the products of the genome and their interactions with the environment. Epigenetics then is just a fancy word for the study of the genome in ways that geneticists haven't traditionally thought of. Yeah, in some respects that's the case because in the past, the whole emphasis was on genetic mutations, changes of the base of an effect or alterations if you use your computer model, of the hardware of the computer. But it's not quite that easy because what we're now talking about is alterations in the software that are running in your computer. So in other words, the environment can introduce, in effect, just like in your computer, bugs. And those bugs usually are harmful. And that's what ends up messing up the programming. And so if you mess this up very, very early, you're going to have that change throughout the whole, all of the cells throughout life. But if you're focusing all your attention, let's say, for example, in diseases, for looking at genetic mutations, you might even be in a region where you know there's got to be a problem, but you can find no genetic mutations. 
the very likely probability is that there aren't any, but you have altered the epigenome. So unless you look for that, you'll never see it. So the phenomena of epigenetics now has changed, I think, the emphasis from completely on the genome and mutations to also now focusing on the software. And of all of us that have used computers, and all of us do, because otherwise you wouldn't be getting these <laughs> questions, right. right? You know that you can have problems with your hardware. Your hardware, your disk can go out, your chips can go out, etc. But you also know that you can have problems with your software. And more than likely, when you have problems with your computer, it probably is not going to be a hardware problem. It's going to be a software problem. And I think from the standpoint of disease susceptibility and diseases in general, though both genetic and epigenetic can cause them, frequency-wise, we're going to be able, we're going to find that many more of them are caused by epigenetic changes than genetic changes. And the reason we haven't found that yet is we haven't focused on the epigenome until now. So talking about focusing on the epigenome and these new ways of, of approaching genetics, you are off to Paris next week for uh, for a conference on right. just this with your colleagues. So, uh, I mean, what's what's the chatter? What are the projects? Uh, I mean, there's probably some excitement at these conferences. Yeah, I mean, it'll be very, it's exciting going to Paris for one, but uh, also it, there'll be a lot of excitement because there's people obviously throughout the whole world that are working on this problem. And from what I can tell, what people are trying to do is not to have, for one, to get other countries involved in this process of defining the epigenome. Defining the epigenome is not going to be singular because every cell has a different one and they can vary in time even within the same cell type. So it, it dwarfs the amount of sequence information, et cetera, and variations that you have just with looking at the genome itself. So it's important that we don't have redundancy in efforts because this is expensive still. So what will be happening at this meeting, I think, will be trying to get not only countries and other investigators involved in, in effect, defining these epigenomes, but also trying to make sure that people don't do the same thing so that we are, we're wasting money, in effect. So I think that's what the meeting is primarily going to be talking, people are going to be talking about right now. Now, when you get into epigenomes and there's so much variation within, within them, you've got lots and lots of information. So you've said that then this mm -hmm. problem becomes not only a, a biology genetics problem, but a, a computer and informatics problem. So what does that look like? Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a huge problem. The, the amount of information, because it's all sequencing, basically. There's three sort of things that are involved. DNA methylation is one of the epigenetic codes. Those are methyl groups, those little tags, they bind to a base, which is called a cytosine base, binds onto it directly. DNA is not altered, just hanging out. It's wrapped around what are called histones. And those have little tails hanging out, and they can be also marked by methylation, et cetera. And by those marks, it tells the, the DNA whether it should be compressed, and as a consequence, the genes not expressed, or opened up, and as a consequence, they now work. And the other thing that's involved is RNA. There's a, other a little bits of non-coding RNA that are involved in this. So there's a, a whole series of different chemical marks that are involved in establishing these epigenomes. There's going to be a ton of data. So you run into the problem, obviously, as you know, because you can you use your computer, of running out of storage space. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a, a serious problem. And when you have so much, like you even get in your program, you use searching engines to find things that you've lost. Right. We're going to have to be using very sophisticated bioinformatics type programs to be able to find different kinds of characteristics that are important in regulating the expressions of these genes. I see, because I come from an engineering background, I see biology becoming more like physics and using stats in bioinformatics and computers more like what my undergraduate degree was than what my graduate degree was in biology. It's not that we won't do some of these sort of more standard biology type uh, experiments, but the world of the future is going to be to a great degree revolving around DNA sequencing and finding information out of this about how genes are regulated and how that leads to diseases. Got it. Now we've got another question here, Professor Jurdle. It's come in by email. And everyone watching can also send in a question 
You can do that by email, live at duke.edu, on Twitter with the tag Duke Live, or on the Duke University Facebook page. And Professor Jurdle, this question comes in from Jeff. We were talking about the research on mice in your lab, and he says, given that the genomes of mice and people are relatively similar, is it your expectation that epigenetic regulation of genes will be the predominant molecular mechanism that explains why mammalian species with such similar genomes wind up looking and behaving very differently from one another? Explain. Yeah. Incredible. I mean, I've got, I get goosebumps when something really hits me. This is a great question, and I do have goosebumps. These programs that we're talking about are basically giving rise to the very development of the individual. So the epigenome of a mouse is very different in a lot of respects than our epigenome. Because if it was the same in effect, because we pretty much have the same genes, not all, but pretty close. If we had the same epigenomes, we'd have a snout and a long tail. And we don't. And then one of the main reasons for it is that our epigenome, our programming, our developmental programming is different. So this means then that animal models might not be exactly appropriate for some diseases that are caused by epigenetic changes. That you will not be able to extrapolate things as readily from one species to the other if it involves primarily epigenetic changes rather than genetic changes. So Unfortunately, in some degree, it means that we're going to have to do a lot more studies with humans because we're interested in our diseases. We don't really want to cure mouse tumors anymore. We want to be able to be able to cure our tumors better, that we will be forced to work more with human samples and human tissues, which means you're going to have to bring whole groups of people together that never were brought together before harder, but you don't have the problem of extrapolation. And I think this is going to be incredibly important for diseases that are involved, that involve epigenetic deregulation rather than genetic mutations. Very good. We've got 45 people participating now in office hours. And, uh, we've I'm going to keep my answers shorter. No, this is, <laughs> they're thorough. We, ne we need its complex material. Now, the question here comes from Sylvie by email. And she asks, we're talking about the medical implications. Mm -hmm. She says, I'm not a scientist, but I'm interested in your research because I'm just a few weeks pregnant. What practical applications does your study have for me? Diet, genes, what do I eat? That kind mm. of thing. Yeah, I mean, one of the graduate students that I had in my lab, Dana Dolanoy, who did a very interesting study with uh, bisphenol A, which is used to make hard clear plastics, is, is having her second child. And so I, I'm very aware of, you know, these kinds of questions because she had the same type of questions. You know, what do I eat now to suppose, you know, try to minimize your exposure to things that might alter the epigenome? Uh, we, Dana showed, actually, that the epigenome was altered by bisphenol A exposure, again, in utero, in this case causing a reduction in methylation. Usually reduction of methylation is not thought of as being advantageous because that's one of the very first changes that occurs, for example, in cancer formation. There's bisphenol A, just to, to lay it out, okay. it, it's uh, in plastics. Bisphenol A is a chemical that's used to make hard, clear plastics. And it gets into our food because things like heat, acid, etc., actually break down the covalent bonds and allows it to come into your food. And all cans, for example, or virtually all cans, are, have a resin inside of them. If you look inside, you see that white sort of color. That is bisphenol A. So how do you can? You heat. If you had something like tomatoes or, or for example, let's say fruit that are acidic, there's a very high probability of that actually extracting the bisphenol A, and it would be in your food. So, and the same thing with sodas, for example. You know, Coke is very acid. Uh, that kind of thing. Now, whether or not bisphenol A causes the same types of problems that we saw, because we see an increased incidence of these yellow animals, which get obese, get diabetes, cancer, uh, we don't know, because we still we do have the same problem of extrapolation. Uh, we don't know what our targets are uh, that are epigenetically labile, but we I think we can extrapolate that. Bisphenol A, at least at the dose that we were talking about, does cause hypomethyl or reduced methylation to occur at the very earliest stages of development. 
what the targets are and if they're affected in a wrong way or negatively, we don't know right now. So for that mother that uh, has a sippy cup for, yeah. her, for, for her baby, uh, should we look for the no BPA model or? Well, that's my person, you know, I, I sort of caution on the side of being conservative. I would tend to try to reduce my uh, exposure if I was uh, pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant or even with children. Uh, exposure to bisphenol A given our studies and a lot of other studies that show that this is uh, involved in cancer formation, etc. So I think it would be advantageous to reduce, if possible, your exposure to bisphenol A. What would help, obviously, is if the cans and things were labeled. Right now we really don't, we don't know. Actually, most of them probably do have that lining, but you don't know. So in, in talking more about medical applications of epigenetics, uh, your colleague here at Duke, Simon Gregory, mm -hmm. has done some research that's found an association between epigenetic changes in autism. Right. So what, um, what's the significance of a study like that? Well, for one, they focused in on, on the oxytocin receptor and showed, I think, pretty sure it was that it was hypermethyl increased methylation, which tends to shut down the gene. Uh, and it was associated with autism. This is very, very important because this is potentially an epigenetic target. And one would be, it would be interesting to see if, for example, people that are, have higher levels, let's say early developmental in cord blood, for example, which we get from children that are born, if the level of different compounds that potentially could cause hypermethylation are increased uh, and you see a change now in those people and its dose response effect, then you would have a, an indication that that compound is causing potentially a problem, maybe autism, through the alteration of the expression of this oxytocin receptor. These are things that will happen now. We're just starting uh, this whole uh, studies of looking for these targets in humans. Another group of targets that we were talking about before that are going to play huge roles in brain development. And as a consequence, when they're deregulated or misregulated, in a number of neurological disorders are these imprinted genes, genes that are expressed only from one copy, either the mother's or the father's. And that silence copy, again, is silenced epigenetically. So the environment can very readily change those uh, marks that are established very early. There seems to be some interest from people watching uh, about these medical implications. And everyone who is watching is invited to ask a question of Professor Jurdle. You can do that by sending an email to live at duke.edu. You can tweet your question with the tag Duke Live or post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page. We've got a question here uh, by email and it says, I have been to a number of seminars where people are making correlations between the use of folic acid during pregnancy and autism, asthma, and other diseases. I don't think anyone would argue that folic acid should be cut out entirely. It's obviously essential at some level. Any ideas on how much is too much folic acid? Hmm. It's, and we should say you're I not a medical this, doctor. You're not giving no, medical but advice. This, I, this is another goosebumpy kind of question because dose is incredibly important. Um, you're going to see different responses. My, my analogy is this again. A glass or two of wine a day might be advantageous and protect your cardiovascular system, but surely a gallon a day is not. And I think the same thing is true potentially of folic acid, that there probably are levels that are advantageous for certain people and other people that maybe can't metabolize it as well, for example, or whatever, uh, need higher or need lower levels. Otherwise, there's going to be too much of a, quote, good thing. Um, what that level is, I don't know. Even in the study that we did, folic acid was a member of another three other compounds that donate methyl groups. So what the dose response is, even within our Goody Mouse model, we have not done. We should probably do this, but we haven't done it yet. And then how that would extrapolate to humans um, is an unknown. I wish I could be clearer about what level would be appropriate and, and what level might be harmful. But I think what I've said by what, I, what I've just said right now is that we're at the beginning of this field 
And I think this question really points out how little we actually know about the importance of epigenetics, exposures to foods, et cetera, and how they alter it and how they're related to diseases later in life. This is the wild, wild west right now. I think ultimately, if you think about it, what we're trying to do now by determining the epigenomes is line by line decoding the, the programs of life. Somebody asked me once, how long do you think we're going to be doing epigenetic research? And my answer was forever. As long as we're here on Earth, we will be doing this type of research because it's so incredibly involved in normal development and as also as a consequence, diseases. So let's talk about working in the wild, wild west of science. Just last year, the National Institutes of Health uh, put forward a plan for studying this and some funding, $190 million. But your study on agouti mouse came out back 2003. Right. So, so talk about working in a research field that um, wasn't a field, that didn't really have a name and is only now being recognized in the scientific community. Well, what I want to say is that there are many people that have been working in the field of epigenetics for a, a, a goodly number of years uh, during the periods of time that were very difficult for these people because obviously, as people would tell them, diseases, cancer, for example, is a genetic disease. It surely can't be due to epigenetic changes. Well, now it's very clear that a number of the, quote, tumor suppressor genes, their activity is inhibited by methylation, which is an epigenetic phenomena, and turns off the expression of these genes. So these were pioneers, and they kept the faith, basically, at times when nobody was really thinking much about this. We got into this field in 1990, and we did a little table, I think, because I had to do an editorial, there were very few papers published on epigenetics in 1990 even, but we surely weren't at the pioneering, pioneering stage, but we were at the early stage. Now we're up in the almost vertical, it's exponential in the number of papers that are being published in, in, in epigenetics. It's growing tremendously. So what does this mean for me? It means that I'm talking to you, and I give a lot of lectures all over the world. I probably could be on an airplane almost continuously and many of the scientists that are involved in this field are doing the same thing because the field is growing so fast and people are finally recognizing its incredible importance to human diseases and normal development. So my life is um, uh, busy. <laughs> so talk about, talk about being a scientist, you're off to Paris, you're being invited to talk all these places. What about the lab? I mean, how do you balance that being at a bench versus uh, giving talks and spreading what you've already learned? It's rough. I mean, fortunately, I have very good people in my laboratory, so my, my lab can work and has worked over the years very, very well but, uh, because I have good people in the laboratory. But it is not easy. You are almost sort of schizophrenic at one time you're out trying to keep things down to a level that, because often you're talking not only to scientists, but also the general public. And you say, well, you're talking to scientists. Yeah, but scientists that might not know the jargon of this field, so you tend to have to talk about it in uh, levels that they can understand. And then you get back into your laboratory, and you're now into a very specific j jargon, and you're talking about very specific experiments. It's hard. It really is, because you are almost schizophrenic, man. You're um, talking different languages, different, different languages cultures. and different cultures all the time, and you're trying to switch back and forth, and sometimes you mess up. You know, if I see allele versus copy, you know, I mean, this is the kind of thing. It means the same thing. Uh, but to the general public, you say, oh, what the heck is that? Copy, they understand. But if you say copy, you would never say that in a research laboratory, ever. We've got another question that's along those lines. We now have uh, 132 people participating in, in the office hours conversation. Do you want here. me to email them all back? <laughs> <laughs> You're already busy enough. You're already, we're going to answer the questions right here. And uh, everyone who's watching can still send in a question. You can do it by Twitter with the tag Duke Live or by email live at duke.edu or on the Duke University Facebook page. This question here comes from Kevin. And he says, when did you know you wanted to study this? What was your major? Were you obsessed um, with 
and this is Hunnett squares, that might be a, uh, a yeah, biology, a technical yeah. term. It's someone yeah. on the inside here. Um, in your biology class, I'm interested to know how you got where you are. Well, um, I follow Yogi Berra's, you know, when you come to a Y in the road, take it. And I've done a number of those, but I got my undergraduate degree in nuclear engineering and then got into biology because of the person that ended up being my major professor gave a course on the biological effects of ionizing radiation. So this would have been I'd be like sort of the late 90s, early 70s, something like that. <clears throat> and I had never heard of DNA at that point. And when I saw it, I, was, it, I said, it's a computer. It's amazing. And from that point forward, I knew I wanted to go into biology, but we didn't have these tools back then. And that's what I did. I ultimately got my degree in radiation biology. That's why I'm in the Department of Radiation Oncology. Uh, so, <clears throat> but a very strong engineering quantitative computer background. Then you go through sort of the wilderness, I would say. You're doing work, but it's not related to what you're doing now. We identified a gene called the IGF-2 receptor as being a tumor suppressor gene in the early 90s. That gene ended up being the very first gene identified in mammals to be imprinted and expressed only from the mother's copy. I had never heard of this before, ever. I said, this is amazing. Here you have a tumor suppressor gene. Now you only need a single hit to inactivate it because there's no backup. It's, the other one's inactivated epigenetically. And I knew at that point, as the early 90s, that we will move our whole laboratory into the field of epigenetics because it was very clear to me that's where biology would go. Now my background in engineering and computer science actually now has become very advantageous because as we said before, what are we doing? Massive sequencing, storing of information, using bioinformatics to pull out characteristics in the genome that are important and give rise to diseases. So I've almost come full circle. So my training was, out, was really outstanding for what I actually ended up doing sort of at the end of my career. And that leads into another question here that comes from Matthew about uh, collaboration. So you're talking about informatics, you're obviously mm -hmm. working with people with some big computers, so he just wants to know um, what epigenetic research collaborations are you working on here at Duke and with other institutions? Well, our big collaboration is really is internal right now, and that's with uh, Alex Hardemink. Uh, because of these imprinted genes, there's only a, probably about 1% of our genes are expressed only from one copy. If you think about it, it's very dangerous because you, you don't have a backup for them. <clears throat> and we used, with working with him, used computer algorithms, sort of pattern recognition algorithms, and that's really how you and I actually first met a number of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, to identify and predict genes that potentially have a high probability of it being imprinted. And with that study, which was published, I think, the end of 2007, 2008, right in there, um, we have a, a small group of genes now that we predict to be have high probability of being imprinted, and we're now finishing up that study by looking at whether those genes truly are, but even more importantly, what the regulatory elements are that control this phenomena, because that's what's epigenetically labile, not the gene itself, but its regulatory element. We call that total group of these regulatory elements the imprintome, another ohm. Uh, and that's what we're working on at this point. That's our main collaboration. Once we get done with that, then we can start looking at the role of imprinting deregulation in basically every disease. So for the very first time in my life, we just put in an application now with people from the psychology department. Why? Because of neurological disorders. Remember I told you we would have to bring in people from all kinds of disciplines to get the kind of information we need to know about humans, not only the samples, how to analyze it. If you're going to look at neurological disorders, you know, what kind of problems they have in processing things, possibly even functional MRI, so you can start looking at different structures of the brain. This is difficult, but it's absolutely required if you're going to be doing human studies, and that's what we're going to have to do. I got gotcha. you. So we've got about 180 people participating mm -hmm. in the office hours now, and everyone watching, 
can ask a question of Professor Jurdle. To do that, send an email to live at duke.edu. You can tweet your question with the tag Duke Live or post it on the Duke University Facebook page. We've got an email here that comes from uh, Bonnie, and she says, it seems as though the field of epigenetics is applicable to numerous fields. Which fields do you think will be affected the most by future advances in genetics? And at the end, she says, yes, hi, Dad. <laughs> My daughter's tweaking me. <laughs> hi, Bonnie. <laughs> uh, it's a personal bias for me, but I think we're... Me personally, where the field of epigenetics is going to make it, it's, it's a lot of places, but a major impact is understanding neurological disorders. Autism, which we already know from Simon Gregory's uh, work here, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, all of these, even drug addictions, um, are going to be impacted greatly by our increased knowledge of epigenetics and I think particularly of the role that that epigenetics plays in regulating imprinted genes. These are developmental disorders to a degree. We think of them, you know, autism occurs at this, you know, one to two, you know, schizophrenia 16 to 20, but these are developmental problems. They actually probably started way back at the earliest stages of development, just like those agouti mice. Those marks were not placed in adulthood they were placed at very probably before implantation in the womb. Now when we start talking big picture along those lines is that not only when a mother eats something during pregnancy can that uh, leave an epigenetic mark that then shows up as a disease or a characteristic in adulthood, it's possible that without a further intervention that that child could then pass along that characteristic to its offspring, possibly. Yeah. <clears throat> these epigenetic marks, most of them are cleared out when they go through the egg and the sperm formation. They're just wiped. It's almost like you're, at least with me, now they'd use exosexure, they use the computer. But in the old days, you used to have these things with wax and the plastic and you'd write on them. So normally, all those marks that you put on there, you flip it up and it's a clean slate and you start over in the next generation. For some reason, at some positions in the genome, that plastic isn't flipped all the way up. It's only flipped a part of the way. So information, epigenetic information, is transferred on to the next generation. Um, in the goody mouse, for example, that does happen. Uh, the thing is not all the way flipped up when this copy of this gene, this weirdness thing, basically, is passed to the mother. And there's probably a number of other places throughout the genome where this occurs. But we don't know yet where they are, which ones are most likely to be affected this way. This is information that will have to be teased out. And I imagine where this will be teased out are going to be, again, studies like the Dutch famine disease people, people that were exposed, the group up in Sweden, for example, where they have three generations. And there's one other, one other place where I think this is going to be studied, and it's a great group of people. It's unfortunate, but the individuals that were exposed to ionizing radiation when the atomic bombs were dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there are about 6,000 people that were exposed in utero. We again see these effects in adulthood, but again, what the mechanisms for them are not known. But the beauty, I hate to use this word because it was a tragedy for these people, obviously. But they've been characterized and monitored for generations, and that data is very clear and very clean. So I think that will be a potentially very important group of people to look at epigenetically. We now have the tools to do it, and we need to start doing these kinds of studies. And what's clear and clean coming out of that data from the people that were exposed to the atomic radiation, the bomb? We know the doses. We know exactly when they were exposed. We even know at what stage of development they were exposed. And with radiation in contrast to chemicals, for example, food, it's there and gone. So then not only that, but we and the Japanese and probably other people throughout the country have been 
providing support to study and follow these people for generations. We have a tremendous data base here of which there's a lot of tissues from probably most of these individuals. So it makes it a particularly unique group of people to look at this transgenerational effect. And so any early indications there about epigenetic marks generation to generation? No, this is just a figment of my imagination. But uh, I think of okay. it as being an incredibly great group of people. And I mean, I don't mean great as it, it's a bad situation, but we have this information and we should use it. And I think that will be done. We now have the tools to be able to look at the epigenomes of these people. So now again, staying on, on the big... Samples from them anyway. <laughs> right, right. So staying on this uh, big picture here, when you have uh, an environmental factor that causes an epigenetic change that's passed one generation to a child and even to a grandchild, that's not how we were taught heredity and, and evolution uh, in biology class. I mean, the, the Darwinian model says that this happens over many generations and it's due to mutation and natural selection. So, uh, you know, that there was an article in The Scientist, you, you recited in it, should the evolution, theory of evolution evolve? Yeah, I wanna, I'm going to read it so I get it cr absolutely correct. And we know about Darwin's uh, theory of natural selection for the fittest. But there is a, um, there's a botanist, uh, sort of evolutionary biologist called J. Arthur Harris. And I love this quote. It says, natural selection may explain the survival of the fittest, but it cannot explain the arrival of the fittest. And once genes were discovered, and the concept went through Mendel, basically, and now we have sequences and stuff and know a lot, lot more, much of the variation that gives rise to, quote, these fittest or not fit, whatever, that can be selected for or against, people thought they were due to genetic mutations. Uh, first in the genes and then maybe in the promoter regions, which would alter potentially the expression, particularly if they're involved in development. All that can give rise to variation that can be selected for or against, right? But epigenetics is another mechanism by, by which you can induce Gen genetic variation or variation in expression and particularly with imprinting because now you have a mechanism and this would only be true in mammals for evolution for example because only mammals uh, theory in mammals have imprinted genes but it's another mechanism by which you could introduce variation that would be epigenetically regulated rather than mutationally regulated or caused and uh, whether that's true or not, I'm not sure. But I'm going to give you an, a, another interesting thing about evolution. When the asteroid hit about 65 million years ago in the Yucatan Peninsula and knocked out 85% of the species on this Earth, mammals, Therian mammals, which are ones that have live birth, which are the marsupials and eutherians, of which we're a member of, and interestingly, angiosperms, flowering plants, did extremely well filling up those niches. Those are the only living things on Earth that we know have imprinted genes. Imprinting provides a potential way to speciate rapidly, but it's now dependent upon software to a degree for the variation. What's the downside of this? Just like in your computer, Software is vulnerable to bugs, and in us, those bugs cause diseases. Very good. We've got another question that's come in, Professor Jurdle, and uh, we've got about 200 people now participating in the online office hours. Uh, and this question, it comes in from an S. Gregory. He asks, can Dr. Jurdle envision epigenetic testing at birth the same way we do for DNA mutations? Yeah, I definitely, and I think it's going to be very important. But again, we're going to have to define where those problems occur. As I said, even if you just focus on imprinting, because this is my obsession, it's not the only thing that's important, but I tell people it's the only thing I'm interested in right now. Um, you're going to have to know where those regions are and how those little regions that are involved in epigenetically regulating things are changed and associated with a disease. Once you know that, you should be able to screen. So diagnostic 
uh, kits, et cetera, now could not only involve, and don't get me wrong, genetic mutations are incredibly important to diseases too, but I do believe that when all of it is said and done, we're going to have genetic mutations here, and that's the tip, the base of that iceberg will be epigenetic changes. And we have to define them, and once we define them, we can use them to diagnose. The advantage of epigenetics, if what I just said is true, also is it creates a different way for medicine to function in a way. Now we're focused more on treatment. If we have many of our diseases are caused because of epigenetic programming problems, it makes a great sense to focus a lot of our medical stuff on prevention. Why is that? Because you can change the programming. A mutation you cannot. You're born with it and you suffer its consequences. But with epigenetic changes, you potentially can alter those mutations, those epi-mutations, and as a consequence, maybe not have the phenotype or the disease. Right, and your lab with the mice studied particularly diet during pregnancy. Correct. I I and we've got another question here. Uh, Sylvie's back with another one, and she <laughs> wants to know about how does stress affect genes? Do you study that, too, with the mice? We don't study it, but uh, I would imagine that, that there's work by uh, Michael Meany and um, Moshe Schiff with, that shows that that type of phenomena after birth, stress, nurturing behavior, for example, is literally causes alterations in gene expression because of m molding the epigenome. In this case, they were looking at the hippocampus of the brain. So there's no doubt that behavior, et cetera, after birth, too, is altering the programming of our brain epigenetically. So stress could be doing this. I just don't know for sure, again, whether how important it is. But in this one model system in rats, uh, it's definitely important. Good. We've, we've got another email question here. And everyone watching is invited to ask a question of Professor Jertle. To do that, you send an email to live at duke.edu. You tweet with the tag Duke Live or post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page. Professor Jurdel, we've been speaking, uh, of course, of mice that you've studied in, in your uh, lab and then also a couple cases of humans. The question here comes from D, and it gets into plants. And she says, how do you think epigenetics will interact with the recent research showing some genetically modified organisms such as various crops and agriculture can cause very adverse health results in laboratory mice. I'm not, I'm not real familiar with you know, the effects of this, but there's no doubt that there's a very potent epigenome within plants. As I said, plants have imprinted genes, just like we do. They're not the same ones, but that same phenomena evolved totally independently in plants. So genetically modifying food can, could potentially alter the epigenome, and whether that end up, ends up being harmful to the plant or potentially to us, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert in this area at all, so I can't comment much more than that on this. I can make a comment, though, about the role of epigenetics maybe in also toxo the toxicological responses in, in animals. Right now, to my knowledge, we're not really measuring the effect of many of the compounds uh, on the epigenome. We're looking primarily, um, I don't want to say exclusively, but it's probably close to that, to how compounds affect genetically species, and our surrogates are mice and, and rats. But how they affect potentially the epigenome is definitely not uh, studied as readily, and as a consequence, we could be missing or we could be actually saying things are not shouldn't be put on that could be safe in us uh, because we're not looking at that angle of, of toxicology, which is the effect of compounds on the epigenome and if they're harmful or not harmful. This will be a whole field, again, that's going to be, I think, has to grow, and maybe the same type of thing needs to be done uh, in the plant world. I'm not a, I love plants, but I don't know very much about them genetically or epigenetically. Good. Uh, well, you've been speaking to it just now, but uh, we've got a follow-up question here from uh, Ragna with the Netherlands email address, and he said, I was wondering what might be the future implications for medicine. So we've been speaking about that. Now that we learn more and more about epigenetics, are we or will we be able to influence it? So the f a first epigenetic medicine, a, a pill, a shot? 
the, this field is most mature in the field of cancer. I was telling you before, these tumor suppressor genes were the promoters, the regions upstream of the gene that tell the gene to work or not to work, end up having a lot of these methyl groups. Uh, there's things called epigenetic therapies. Um, I won't go into what they are, but they can alter this methylation pattern and open up genes that were normally inappropriately shut down. And as a consequence, in some types of cancer, particularly some types of leukemia, it's been very effective in the treatment. We might even have, for example, compounds that we're using now that are affecting, let's say, the epigenome in the brain. Uh, valproic acid, for example, is used in the treatment of epilepsy. It's also a histone deacetylase, uh, HDAC inhibitor. Uh, anyway, it alters the epigenome also, so maybe some of the effects we're seeing with that might even be epigenetic, and we just don't really know about that yet. So I think, again, this is the wild, wild west, but it's a new way of looking at the treatment of disease. But as I said, I think, too, that one of the more important things ultimately is the prevention of the disease and maybe getting people through these problems, maybe through the use of some of these uh, epigenetic therapies so that they don't have, let's say, schizophrenia or autism. You can get them past those problems, and maybe they, they would have a perfectly, quote, normal life. I don't know. But this, this is where I see this field going. That's great. Well, you've been uh, working hard and answering everybody's questions here. And uh, so I want to wrap up. And um, one way that you've put some of the implications of epigenetics is that uh, not only are you are what you eat, but you are what your parents eat, possibly, and your grandparents. Right. So, so as we close up here and talking about epigenetics, I think uh, that's something people can get their mind around. You are what you eat. But... Talk about this extra layer of maybe you are what your parents eat, your grandparents. Well, again, we get, this gets back to the potential for transgenerational inheritance of these epigenetic changes. Um, it's an incredibly important field for, uh, we have to look at in greater detail for a lot of different reasons. Um, but right now, in humans, there's very, very little known about it. And even in mice, except for our model system, there's not a lot known about that either. But it's definitely an area of research that has to be, and I'm sure will be, investigated. And we have the model systems and uh, to do this. It just is going to take time and effort. This is a big, big problem. As I said, how long are we going to be doing epigenetic research? Forever, as long as we're on Earth. Well, thank you very much for coming in and holding these online office hours. Everyone watching who wants to follow Professor Drudel's research and look for his Genome Imprint Lab website. And uh, you're invited to come back to this Duke Ustream channel next week for an office hours conversation with Professor Negar Motaheta talking about Iran and how the struggles there are represented in film and video. For everyone wanting to learn more about Duke, visit duke.edu.